Good morning, all. I hope you're doing well. Um, I hope life's treating you wonderfully and uh, I'm staying healthy and everything. Um, if you have a cat, I hope it has rabies, like apparently this one does. If you have a dog, I hope he gets a chance to play in the snow. Um, and if you have a dog and a cat, I hope they get along well. Um, today we're going to talk about market labor demand in the orthodox approach, although we will talk a little bit about other approaches. Um, but basically, we're doing neoclassical labor demand today. Um, various stuff to do. Big ideas in orthodox labor economics. Companies hire where the value of the workers' project product, the marginal revenue product of labor, exceeds the wage. So they hire up to the point where the marginal revenue product, the value of what that marginal work is producing, equals the wage. You hire right up to that point. <laughs> I can. I mean, I, I, I think I feel like I probably say this like every lecture. Here's another thing you can tell your parents when they want to know what you've learned. What are you doing in that expensive college of yours? What are you getting out of it? And the answer is, for today, the answer is you have learned that companies should hire up to the point where the marginal revenue product of labor equals the wage. Um, so employment will rise with higher productivity and with lower wages. It will fall with lower productivity and higher wages. Um, so wages go up. You have to find the point where the marginal revenue product is higher, which means less workers. Productivity goes up. Your marginal revenue product curve shifts up and the point where it equals the wage is further out. Um, really? So why do they have higher children? Well, I guess the wage is really, really low. Okay, labor demand depends on the marginal revenue product of labor. Marginal revenue product is the value of output. You don't pay your workers in stuff, you pay them in dollars. So it's the value of the output produced by one more worker the price of output times the quantity of stuff the workers produce. So it's price times marginal product of labor. Um, we will, in the orthodox model, we assume that the price is fixed. You hire more workers, produce more. It has no effect on the, on, uh, on the price because yours, a perfect competitor, you're a small producer in a big market. Probably not true for most, most employers, but we're going to ignore that for now. The neoclassical model, price is fixed. So we just forget about the price. It's just a shift term. Uh, the marginal product of labor, that's the key thing. Hire more workers, you move down the marginal product of labor. So your marginal revenue product of labor curve is going to be downward sloping because the marginal product of labor is downward sloping and the price is fixed. There we go. I hope you are not like this guy. You know, dogs can be pretty clever, pretty smart, but they're not always good at economics. Corduroy sleeps through classes. He's heard this stuff about nine times and he still doesn't get it. And you know what? He doesn't care. I hope you care. Okay. Don't hire where the marginal revenue product is less than the wage because you're losing money on those people. And again, something that I feel like I say a lot, businesses are not Ellie Mossonary institutions. They're not charities. You hire up to the point where marginal revenue product equals the wage or wage equals price times marginal revenue, pr marginal product or wage divided by the price equals the marginal product price being constant. Labor demand curve is the marginal revenue product of labor curve. Woo! Okay, so here you are. You're a business person. You're a smart business person. You're not like, well, 
<laughs> I doubt my father ever did this stuff, but he had a very good sense of things. Um, but you do better than having a sense. You have a spreadsheet. Workers, additional workers, total amount of pots produced. Marginal product of pot is the change in the pot you get from additional workers. It is downward sloping because additional workers have less and less with which to work. Marginal revenue product is the price of output, net of other variable costs. So, you know, we're going to forget about that, but do keep it in mind. Um, you may sell your pot for hundred dollars. You think, oh, you know, hundred dollars, but actually, if each ounce, additional ounce, costs you seventy dollars in fertilizer, seeds, extra electricity, or whatever, you really only get thirty dollars, and that's what you use in thinking about um, uh, hiring more workers. Having said that, we're going to forget about it <laughs> until you get to the problem set. Um, pot sells for hundred dollars an ounce. Multiply the marginal product. The net price of pot is hundred dollars an ounce. Um, multiply the marginal product of labor by hundred, and that gets you the marginal revenue product. Twenty dollars of output, two thousand dollars. Woo! Two dollars of output. Uh, sorry, two ounces of output, only two hundred dollars. How many workers do you have? This is your demand curve for labor. Productivity, no more than that pay. Workers are paid $1,000, then you hire three. Workers are paid $400, you hire six. Workers are paid $200, you hire seven. Workers are paid $2,000, dangerous work, you hire one. What about how much output you get? <laughs> This is clever, isn't it? Clever. You didn't see this coming, but you actually have a theory of output. Your theory of output. Um, workers paid $1,000, you hire three, and your output is 45. Workers are paid $400, you hire six, and your output is 63 ounces. Workers are paid $2,000, high wages, have to scale back production, you hire only one worker and you produce 20. Clever. Hire her? Nah. <laughs> Why is labor demand downward sloping? Because the marginal product of labor falls with more workers, so employees will only hire additional workers at lower wages. Okay, here's your marginal revenue product labor curve. It's also the labor demand curve. Marginal product of labor is downward sloping, higher, fewer workers at higher prices. So that you move up your marginal product of labor curve, which is your marginal revenue, which gives you the marginal revenue product curve. If wages go down, you hire more workers, moving down your marginal revenue product curve. Higher workers where the value of their product at least covers the wage. High productivity, your high output prices, higher more, low productivity, low output prices, higher less. You want a job, be productive. Raise the value of what you're producing. Or if you want a job, accept lower wages. Some of these things aren't going to happen anymore. California, it's totally legal. Everybody walks around stoned. <laughs> I'm not good at drugs. I occasional alcohol. Um, it's quite a while since I had a pot. Um, shared a joint with my wife year, two years ago. Um, Wife sometimes smokes with our daughters. Um, it just doesn't do anything for me. I'm such a boring person. Prior to that, I think the last time I smoked was 1985, 86. You know, I was at the home of a friend. He smoked a lot. Wife really disapproved. 
they would divorce soon after. Okay, what happens to labor demand when the product price rises? Shifts out the whole curve, you hire more people. Here's higher prices. Prices go up, move out. Prices fall, you move in. Because you're not dealing with quantity, you're really dealing with value. Um, need workers to produce more value. Find a way to make them more productive. How do you do that? Get them more stuff to work with, which of course means that the net price goes down because yet, you know, depending on what it is, it's if it's fixed course, it doesn't matter. But if it's more grow lights using more electricity, better seeds, these things come out of the price that you're selling the stuff for. So you have to think about that, distinguish between variable costs that go up, making workers more productive, or fixed costs that go up, making workers more productive, which has no effect on the net price. Um, why is there poverty? In this approach, it's because the workers are unproductive. They lack skills. They lack complementary capital. So what do you do? If you're a liberal, you say, well, let's give them more education. Let's spend more on education. Maybe let's provide job training. Give companies credits for spending more money on training workers. American companies spend relatively little on training workers compared to German companies or Japanese companies. The Germans and the Japanese expect they're going to be keeping the workers for a long, long time. So they train them. American companies are like, ah, we don't want to keep the workers very long. We just want to be able to go out and hire people and let's get rid of them. We want more flexibility so we don't invest in the workers. Difference. Okay. Uh, the liberal approach. Encourage companies to train the workers or give the workers more general education training. The conservative approach is spend money, give companies credits to invest in machinery. Um, you know, subsidize um, capital investments, lower capital gains taxes so companies will invest more in machinery. See, both of these those come from the orthodox neoclassical model because both of them focus on how can we raise the worker's marginal product? An alternative approach is some jobs are productive and some aren't. It doesn't necessarily matter where, what the workers are like. What makes them productive is they are in a productive job. They're in a job that's well organized. They're in a job where workers are paid well, so they work harder. They're part of a team that is focused on productivity. Um, maybe they live in a community that is more productive. Think about it. The most value-added industries in the United States are highly concentrated in the most expensive locales. What are our most productive industries? Entertainment. Yeah, I know they film a lot of stuff in Toronto or Vancouver or overseas, but the real value added for Disney, Netflix, Amazon is in the Beverly Hills, Los Angeles area. Los Angeles has, God, a couple of years ago, it had over 600,000 people involved in entertainment. It's not just video entertainment, it's also music. Um, and that's part of it because you have the music, you have the video, you have the film crews, you have set designers, you have people who specialize in finding locations. And of course you have the actors and the acting classes and the agents. They're all together in one place. And that makes the Los Angeles Beverly Hills area enormously productive for entertainment. The most productive area in the world with the possible exception of Bombay, uh, sorry, Mumbai. Um, no place else compares. There used to be major film industries in Berlin and London and Paris and um, Milan, but they've all really fallen by the wayside. Um, second industry, high tech. High tech is, oh my God, is it concentrated. Um, you know, in the Palo Alto, uh, San Jose area. 
which is enormously expensive again. Um, you know, I mean, it goes out to Pal from Palo Alto up to San Francisco, and then you also have major high tech in New York, and you have major high tech minor information technology high tech in the Boston area. Biochemical, um, bioengineering, pharmaceuticals, on the other hand, is very concentrated in the Boston area. It's like, uh, why? I mean, these are the most expensive places, to, but that's where workers are very productive because they are with other workers who are in the same area um, and the same industry. Um, finally, um, finance. Wall Street, Midtown Manhattan. You know, I, yeah, a little bit in Boston, a little bit in Philadelphia, but basically finance um, is all in the New York City area. Um, I can't ridiculously expensive. I was sitting on an airplane once and chatting with uh, the woman in the seat next to me. Um, she was a secretary, a, you know, a, um, office assistant, not an office manager, office assistant. She answered telephones, made schedules, etc. for one person. She was paid enough that she lived in a $1,500 apartment on the Upper East Side, what we used to call Spanish Harlem. You know, a tiny apartment that cost $1,500, okay, but she could afford it because she was paid so much. So is she, is she productive? I guess she counts as highly productive, but it's nothing about her. You know, she was no, wasn't productive enough to have anything, to do anything but make schedules and answer telephones. Um, so it's not that she was so productive, but she's in a highly productive industry. The same for clerical workers, low level, people who pack boxes for Biogen are paid more than people who pack boxes in Kentucky for whatever it is they do in Kentucky. Um, you know, Nashville, that's another place for entertainment, the music, you know, very concentrated. And um, the industries with the highest paid low skilled workers are the same industries that have the highest pay high skilled workers. Everybody, the whole pay scale goes up in these industries, even though they're in the most expensive areas. They're expensive areas because they're, the industries there are doing so well. Those industries are so productive and it has nothing to do with the characteristics of the workers. Well, that's the alternative approach. Okay, labor demand, different labor productivity. This is the orthodox approach. Um, make workers more productive, you'll hire more workers. What raises worker productivity? The orthodox approach, marginal product of labor goes up with better technology. Yeah, come up with better technology. More and better machinery, better training for workers. You know, again, here we're distinguishing between the orthodox approach, um, liberal, better training. Generally, the Obama, Clinton, Democrats want better technology. Um, the conservatives want more traditional conservatives, the Bush variety, Reagan, Bush, more and better machinery. Um, the far right, as you start getting to, you know, the racist approach, the Trumpians, better workers get genetics, or maybe better families, encourage people to marry. Um, don't let them have premarital sex, um, punish them if they do, da, da, da. Okay, what raises labor productivity? The alternative approach, jobs. Some jobs are more productive. And these are jobs where um, maybe companies have monopoly power, Apple, Disney, definitely have some monopoly power um, and can charge inflated prices. Um, you know, Wall Street firms have access to capital and finance and banks, you know, that give them a certain monopoly power. We'll talk about this more in a few, a few more lectures when we get to finance. Um, maybe these are companies with better management, better technology. I mean, you know, you get to Wall Street, biotech, 
um, uh, Pixar, you know, better technology. Um, Pixar is now owned by Disney, which <laughs> which ruined it. <laughs> um, okay, better and more effective teams, more effective division of labor, more machinery with which to work. That gets back to the other approach. Okay, key to higher wages, better working conditions, get one of the good jobs. You know, I mean, why are software engineers and electrical engineers paid more than uh, insurance underwriters? Training, technology, yeah, but also they're working for companies that are higher productivity, higher wage companies, technical rights. I mean, you're like, who, what is it? When we talk about skill, what do we mean? You know, technical writers have a lot of skill. Um, I had an office mate in grad school. Um, <laughs> at one point, I had three offices. It was ridiculous. But uh, I had an office where I was teaching um, in the social studies program. And um, he was getting his PhD in sociology from Harvard. Good school. Um, but he was planning to become a technical writer. He's going to leave um, with his PhD and go to work for a company as a technical writer uh, because it paid better than sociology uh, jobs, I guess, or it's what he wanted to do, whatever. I don't know. He was sick of academe. Um, data analyst, you know, I mean, why is, what's the skill differential between them and electrical engineers who are paid $20,000 more, you know? Um, insurance underwriters, buyers, you know, um, versus business analysts. I, I don't know. I think I don't think it's about individual skill. I think it's about which companies you work for. And the electrical engineers, the software developers, are working for companies that are more productive, partly because they have a certain monopoly power, uh, but also um, they're highly concentrated geographically. They get large government subsidies, um, and they're the, um, uh, you know, they're often not true of Microsoft, but true of Apple and Google. They're very good at team, organizing teams for team production. Best jobs for women. Um, these are not just coming out of grad school, uh, coming out of college. Um, they're the best jobs for women in general. Um, the best jobs for women generally have a low proportion of women. Um, certified nurse midwives pays well, um, but it's the only, well, chief nursing officer, yeah, but uh, senior fashion designers, you know, yeah, but generally speaking, if you're a woman, you don't want to work with other women, you'll make more money. And here's just a listing of some of the states that have um, average wages. West Virginia, average wage, $25 an hour. Massachusetts, $36 an hour, $37 an hour. Um, California is $36 an hour. Um, Connecticut, I have Connecticut here, $34 an hour. Um, why are people paid more in Massachusetts than in New Jersey? <laughs> I mean, if it was up to me, I would much rather live in Massachusetts than New Jersey. Um, maybe it's because I grew up in New York. Uh, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong, and feel free to drop me an email about this. New Jersey sucks. New Jersey is the horrible thing between New York and Philadelphia. The horrible traffic jam, and it smells bad. Oh, my God. My favorite aunt and uncle um, and my favorite cousins lived in Jersey, and we visited them a lot. Uh, Oh, I would get sick in the car going past the refineries and things. Oh, it's awful. Ugh. Jersey. Um, I'm not fond of Connecticut either, but, you know, my sister lived in Connecticut and they're a nice place in Connecticut. Connecticut is also between Massachusetts and New York, so it's in the way. Um, but uh, Connecticut's not so bad. Um, still, um, you'd think that people in Jersey would be paid more to compensate them for the disutility of living in New Jersey. No, they're paid less than Massachusetts. Um, I guess we're just better, better people. 
Um, why are we paid more than California? California has high tech and entertainment. Massachusetts has biotech, little high tech, some finance. We're not very entertaining, especially not when the socks are doing badly. Um, for a while, Massachusetts did have the most successful major league sports teams franchises. Okay, Alabama, Arkansas, West Virginia. Uh, okay, these places suck. Um, we should have never let them back in the union. We should have carved them up as territories like uh, Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens wanted to do, conquered territories. Um, and certainly we should have never let them vote until they reformed. But that notwithstanding, why are workers in the paid so little? What industries do they have? I mean, you could be a college graduate, have a good education, come out and to work in Arkansas, and you'll be paid a lot less than California, New York, New Jersey, or Massachusetts. Why? It's not your personal skill. It's at the companies you work for and the environment you're in are less productive. Um, okay, the orthodox theory is about individual choice of capacity, preferences, factor endowments, technology. Remember these three things, if you get nothing else out of this class, these three things are the basis of the entire neoclassical orthodox economic system. Jobs theory is about the characteristics of firms or community, better management, better labor relations, physical social infrastructure, economies of agglomeration, monopolistic power. Yeah, um, that is a different approach. Um, the orthodox theory is what you need to know as you go forward academically, because most economists, virtually all economists you're ever going to encounter after this class are orthodox neoclassicists. But if you want to understand the world, I recommend you think about the jobs theory. <sighs> okay. Workers are members of a team. Productivity is not just about the workers. It's about the team. Smart and talented people built an atom bomb because they were helped by other smart and talented people. Orthodox approach separates productivity from the wage, since productivity determines the wage. What if people work harder because they're paid more or work less if they're paid less? We're going to get to this in a couple lectures. It's called efficiency wage theory. Um, Larry Summers, who you may have heard of, is one of the pioneers in this. Um, it's suggested by, of all people, Larry's uncle, um, Robert Solo. Companies can train better paid workers. It may not be that the workers want to work harder, but they work better because they're better trained. This is characteristic of workers in Germany who get a lot more job training than we do. Okay, companies will hire workers where the value of what they produce exceeds the wage, higher up to wage equals marginal revenue product equals the price times the marginal product of labor. More workers, productivity is high, product price is high, wage is low, fewer workers in other cases. Okay, um, that's all folks. Um, very cool. Um, <laughs> once again, we encounter the orthodox theory, uh, including preferences, factor endowments, and productivity, and technology. Remember those three. Um, productivity comes from factor endowments and technology. That determines the demand for labor. The supply curve of labor comes from preferences. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So until then, Live long and prosper. Bye-bye. Have a great day.